Family Theater presents George Murphy, Ruth Hussey, Charlie Ruggles, and Parley Bear. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, brings you George Murphy, Charlie Ruggles, and Parley Bear in Irvin S. Cobb's familiar classic, Old Judge Priest. To introduce the drama, your hostess, Ruth Hussey. Thank you, Jean Baker. This is a story about old Judge Priest and one of his many experiences with the more human side of everyday events that possibly most of us pass by too quickly as we hurry through our lives. Irving S. Cobb conceived these stories, as he said in his own words, to acquaint the world with the fact that his fellow Kentuckians were just plain folk with whom uh, we might find in Iowa or Indiana or any state in this great union. Here with old Judge Priest, a man with as big a feeling of compassion for his fellow men as the girth around his stomach. And Peepo Day, whose counterpart we see all too seldom in the tempo of our time. We're privileged to present Charlie Ruggles as Peepo Day and Parley Bear as Old Judge Priest, with George Murphy as your narrator. <laughs> Old Judge Priest puffed into his chambers at the courthouse, looking with his broad beam and his costume of flappy, loose white ducks, very much like an old-fashioned full rigger with all sails set. Placing his old cotton umbrella in the corner, he removed his coat and hung it on a peg behind the door. He sat down heavily at his desk where he gave attention to his mail. There was a bill for five pounds of his favorite smoking tobacco, notice of a lodge meeting, and the bottom of the pile, a long envelope addressed to him by his title instead of his name. In the upper right-hand corner were several British stamps. Carefully, the judge adjusted his steel-bowed spectacles and read the first paragraph. Well, skin me for a possum. Not a single word was missed as he read to the bottom of the page and noted the closing signature. <whistles> judge Priest wriggled himself free from the snug embrace of his chair arms. <laughs> waddled out of his office and down the long, empty hall to the office of Sheriff Giles Birdsong. Good morning, Giles. Morning, Jage. Come in and sit. No, thank you, son. I won't come in. I got a little job for you. I wished if you ain't too busy, you'd step down the street and see if you can find Peep a Day for me. Peep a Day? And fetch him back here with you. Uh, what old Peep been doing, Jage? He ain't done nothing. But he's about to have something of a highly unusual nature done to him. I found him, Judge. He's outside here in the hall. Well, much obliged to you, son. Send him in. Peepo Day was a man seemingly but a few years younger than the judge himself. A man who looked to be somewhere between 65 and 70. There was a look in his eyes that you quite often see in the eyes of stray dogs. Dogs that are fairly yearning to be adopted by somebody. Anybody. <clears throat> oh, howdy, Peep. Come on in. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, seems to me I heard somewhere years back that your regular Christian name was Paul. Is that right? Yes, yeah, surely is, sir. But I ain't heard it for so long, I come mighty nigh forgetting it sometimes myself. <laughs> Folks started in to call me Peep when I was a little shaver, and on account of my last name being O'Day, I reckon. <laughs> but your real entitled name is Paul. Yes, sir. Paul Felix O'Day. Uh-huh. And wasn't your father's name Philip and your mother's name Catherine Dwyer O'Day? Yeah, my mother's name weren't Catherine, Judge. It was just plain Kate. <laughs> Kate or Catherine, it makes no great difference. I reckon the record's straight so far. And now, think hard, Pete. Can you remember ever hearing of an uncle named Daniel O'Day, your father's brother? Mm, 
Well, I don't know nothing about my people, Judge. Only just know that they come over from some place with a funny name in the old country before I was born. From Ireland, yes. The onlyest kin I ever had over here was that no count trifling nephew of mine, Perstwire. I reckon you call him to mind, Judge? Yeah, he used to hang around this town before they chased him out. Tell me, Peep, what are you doing now for a living? Well, sir, I'm knocking about doing the best I can, which ain't much. <laughs> I help out around Gaffer's delivery stable, and Pete, he lets me sleep in a little room back at the feed room, and his wife gives me my victuals. Pete, what was the most money you ever had in your life all at one time? Well, I reckon not more than six bits. At any one time, that is, sir. Well, Pete, such be in the case. What would you say if I was to tell you you're a rich man? Well, I reckon, Judge, if it didn't sound disrespectful, I'd say you was pranking with me. No, no, I'm not pranking with you, Pete. It's my pleasant duty to inform you that at this very moment, you are the rightful owner of 8,000 pounds. Uh, pounds of what? <laughs> pounds in money, of course. <laughs> Outside in the hall, with one ear held conveniently near the crack in the door, Sheriff Giles Birdsong gave a violent start. And then at once he was torn between the desire to stay and hear more and the urge to hurry forth and spread the unbelievable tidings. After the briefest of struggles, the latter inclination won. In the meantime, old Pete merely stared at the judge in a state of dull bewilderment. Uh, Judge, 8,000 pounds of money ought to make a powerful big pile, oughtn't it? I mean pound sterling, peep, English money. In our money, it'll figure out somewhere near, oh, $40,000. It was left to you by your Uncle Daniel. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> have you have you got it here with you, sir? No, 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 they didn't send it along with the letter. That wouldn't be regular. There'll be some proofs to be got up and sworn to, and then you'll likely have to sign a lot of papers. Oh, well, then I'm afraid I won't be able to claim that there money, Judge. I... Why not? Well, because I don't know how to sign my own name. I can't neither read nor write. <laughs> you don't need to worry about that, Peep. You can make your mark. Yeah. Uh, I wonder, sir, I wonder if it'll be very long before that there money gets here and I can begin to have the spending of it. Making plans already? <laughs> yes, sir, I am. Well, Peep, I judge it's hardly fitting for a man of substance to go on living the way you've had to live during your life. Just what do you mean by that, Judge? Well, I'd suggest you go right down to Feldberg Brothers when you leave here and get yourself fitted out with some suitable clothing. Yeah, but I ain't yet got Now, there. you tell them I sent you and that I'll guarantee payment. Now, I reckon that'll be hardly necessary when the news of your good luck gets nosed around. I misdoubt if there's any firm in town as wouldn't be mighty glad to have you on their books as a steady customer. Well, now, thank you, Judge. And also... If I was you, I'd arrange to get me some regular board and lodge in summers around town. Uh, yes, sir, I'll do just as you say, sir. But if you don't mind, I'd like to go on living at uh, Gafford's. Pete and his wife both have been mighty good to me. Yeah, suit yourself about that, Peep. Yeah, them Gafford's has been pretty nigh the only real friends I ever had that I could count on. Uh, <clears throat> I reckon, sir, it'll be a right smart while, won't it, before that money gets here from way across the ocean? Well, yeah. Yes, I imagine it will. Was you figuring on investing a little of it now? Yes, yes, sir, I was. About how much did you think of spending for a beginning? Well, sir, I, I could use as much as a silver dollar. <laughs> but of course, since now, that you... sounds kind of moderate to me. I reckon that detail can be arranged. <laughs> Here, Peep. Here's your dollar. Oh, no, sir, no, sir. Go I on, couldn't... take it. I'm just advancing it to you out of what'll be coming to you shortly. Well, thank you, Judge. Thank you, sir. Another thing, Pete. Now that you're wealthy, I kind of imagine quite a passel of fellows around here is going to suddenly discover themselves strangely and affectionately drawn toward you. Yes, sir, Judge. Now, if such be the case, I'd suggest you just tell them that I'm sort of acting as your unofficial advisor in money matters. You get my general drift? Yes, sir. Yeah, I won't forget. And thank you again, Judge, for letting me have this here dollar ahead of time. I wonder now. I wonder what a man of 60-odd-year-old is going to do with the first whole dollar he ever had in his whole life. 
Miss Wilde? Well, Peep? Yeah, I was wondering, ma'am, if No. You... No, we don't need any walk swept or barns cleaned today or any other day by you. Now, I've told you 40 times. Go on back to the livery stable where you belong. Yes, ma'am, but uh, it ain't work I'm after, Miss Wilde. I was wondering, could I might possibly make a purchase? With what? With this silver dollar, ma'am. Silver dollar? You? How'd you come by a silver dollar? Yes, ma'am. If it ain't too much trouble, ma'am, I'd like a five-cent bag of jelly beans, a ten-cent bag of mixed candies, the kisses and the kind with the words on them, you know, and a five-cent bag of gumdrops. Well, for mercy's sake. Yes, ma'am, and some roasted peanuts and two of them prize boxes, them that rattles heaviest, please, ma'am, and a coconut, and uh, uh, have I got any of that dollar left? Well, let me see. Five, ten, twenty, thirty-five, fifty-five, seventy... Yes, you got 30 cents left. Well, I'm grateful, ma'am, and I'll take a half a dozen of them red bananas and a half a dozen of them yellow bananas. Well, I do say... Yes, ma'am, and here's your silver dollar, and I'll just take my purchases and be off with them. Thank you, ma'am. I'm ever so much obliged to you. Needless to say, the news of People Day's good fortune moved in every direction, like ripples on a pond. And with each succeeding ripple, the size of the legacy grew. Various persons suddenly remembered that they too were descended from the old days of Ireland and wrote forthwith to stake their various claims. There was one, however, who read the news with a certain amount of legitimate anticipation, the aforementioned Purse Dwyer, People Day's no-account trifling nephew. Now, there was nothing he could do about it at the moment, occasioned by the fact that he was currently confined in a workhouse at Evanston, Indiana. But, well, we're getting a little ahead of our story. In the days that followed, Giles Bird's song kept the good judge well informed on the doings of the town's latest and newest tycoon. Hey, judge, old Peep's got six or eight youngsters of fallen as ever moved. Why, today, he bought a little red wagon and loaded up with all kinds of eatables. A little and- red wagon? Yes, sir. and then he hitched himself up to it just like a horse and drug it out to Bradshaw's Grove, and then they had a picnic. Well, I declare. And they went in a swimming in Guthrie's gravel pit ditch, all of naked as jaybirds. Ah, scandalous. Yes, sir. Uh, today, him and then our boys swiped watermelons from Mr. Dick Bell's patch. I do declare. And you being sheriff, Giles, you let Peep get away with that? Well, I, uh, I didn't see it myself, Judge. The climax came at the end of two months With the arrival of old People Day's legacy It was in the form of bills of exchange Delivered to the judge And turned to be handed over to the legatee Well, it's here, Peep What do you want to do with it? Well, first off, Judge I'd be powerful obliged If you'd pay off all my outstanding owings As good as done, Peep And take out the various and sundry advancements You so kindly give me Got them all figured to the penny and then you can arrange to put the money in a safe place, Judge. That is, if it ain't too much trouble. We'll take it over to the planter's bank, and with that done, Peep, I'm going fishing. Due to this jaunt for piscatorial pleasure, Judge Priest missed the next of old People Day's follies. The circus came to town. It was a little circus boasting but one dwarfish and dilapidated elephant, but the line of yelling, laughing children who followed the glowing Mr. O'Day into the tent consisted of every one of the juvenile population who otherwise, through lack of funds, would have been denied the opportunity to patronize this circus or, in fact, any circus. En masse, they hooped and hollered at the various attractions, but none of them hooped louder or laughed longer than did their elderly and bewhiskered friend who sat among them paying the bills. On arriving home from the circus, People Day found, sitting on the doorstep, a young man of untidy and unshaven aspect, a young man who continually rubbed the ankles of his thin shanks as if to ease the ache where so recently a ball and chain had been hitched. Howdy, Uncle Paul. Purse. 
first wife. Yep, your only living nephew, Uncle Paul. I've come back. Well, you can just go back again. I don't want no traveling with such as you. But I'm your only kin, Uncle Paul. You just got to remember the ties of blood that bind us two together. Yeah, what do you want? Well, it uh, seems to me that us both being descendants of... Uh, Dear Uncle Daniel O'Day, him that died and left the money, that is. What do you want? Well, seems to me we should both share all that money. Half to you and half to me. Uh, no, sir. That money's mine. It was left to me fair and legal. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. I tried to do the right thing, but now I'm going to take right and proper legal steps. Uh, what do you mean by that? You're as crazy as a coot, Uncle Paul. And I got every citizen of this town to say so, same as me. I'm going to get myself set up as your legal guardian. Come in. Well, Purse. Purse Dwyer. What are you doing back in town? I got a right to be here. I served my time. Did I say you haven't? Merely ask a civil question. But no more money, Purse. You've outlived your usefulness to me. No, I ain't, Mr. Sublet. Not nearly. I'm more useful to you right now than I ever was. A remarkable statement. In what way? Mr. Sublet, you know Pete O'Day? I'm aware of who the gentleman is, but don't move in the same financial circles. No, sir. But you could. How's that? I was uh, figuring, with all them crazy didos he's cutting up and most folks saying he's crazy one way or another... Wouldn't it uh, stand to reason that you could make the courts appoint a guardian for Uncle Pete? Yes. Yes, it, it stands to reason. And who but his loving nephew should be that guardian? Sit down, Purse, have a cigar. How fortunate you brought your case to me. Peep, you understand, don't you, that this here fragrant nephew of yours is... Fixing to try and prove that you're feeble-minded? Yes, sir, Judge. And he's asking to be appointed to the job of taking charge of your money and the spending of it from here on. I understand, Judge Priest. All right, then. Now, I'm going to fix a hearing for tomorrow morning at 10. Is that agreeable to you? Whatever you say, Judge. Good. Colonel Farrell is a public defendant speaking for you. Yeah, oh, Peep, if I was you, I wouldn't draw out any more money from the bank twixt now and the time I make my decision. <laughs> District Court is now in session. The Honorable William Pittman Priest, Judge, presiding. <coughs> Be seated. <coughs> this court will hear for the plaintiff. Your Honor, gentlemen of the jury, even though it is irregular, with the court's permission, I should like to address my meager words to the assembled ladies and gentlemen in this august court chamber. For my words are not to be an indictment, my friends. Our efforts are not selfishly motivated. But on behalf of my client, Mr. Percival Dwyer, may I say his motives are engendered only out of the kindness of his heart to aid and befriend an aged man who is fast approaching senality? No, gentlemen, my client does not seek for himself, but for his uncle. Mrs. Wheel, would you say the defendant had ever given you cause or anyone else cause to believe that he was not entirely competent? If by that you mean to... I think he doesn't have good sense. The answer's yes. Any time a grown man buys a dollar's worth of candy and gigas and sits on the curb to eat them, it bears looking into. Tommy Granger, have you ever seen Peep O'Day give away vast sums of money? Yes, sir. Why, he shells out a penny or a nickel for us boys most any time we ask him. Regard Jackson, is it true that Peep O'Day took you and many other children to the circus and that he bought you popcorn, candy, and many other things and that you spent not one cent of your own money? Jennings Talbot, is it true that on the night of July 22nd, Mr. Peep O'Day suggested to you and seven other boys that you raid Mr. Bell's watermelon patch and that he personally led the expedition? Now, if my learned colleague, the Honorable Colonel John Farrell, is ready, I retire in his favor. 
May it please your honor, my client, Mr. O'Day, will make a personal statement and thereafter you will rest content, leaving the final arbitrament of the issue to your honor's discretion. I object! On what grounds does the learned counsel object? On the grounds that it is our contention that the man in question, namely Mr. O'Day, is patently and plainly a victim of senility, an individual prematurely in his dotage, any utter, utter, any utter, anything that he says will be of no use whatsoever. Objection overruled. The court will hear the defendant, and I must caution you, he is not to be interrupted while making his statement. Go on, Mr. O'Day. <laughs> say what you have to say. <clears throat> uh, Judge Priest, Mr. Sublet, there's maybe some here as knows how I was raised and fetched up. My ma and pa died when I was just only a baby, so I was brung up out here at the old county poorhouse as a pauper. While other boys was going to school and playing hooky and going in washing in the creek, I had to work. I never done no playing around in my whole life, not till just here recently anyway. But I've always had a hankering to be a boy and do all the things a boy does and to do the things I couldn't do whilst I was of a suitable age to be doing him. I called to mind I used to dream in my sleep about doing him. So when this money come to me, I said to myself, I, I was going to make that there dream come true. And I started out for to do it. And I done it. Oh, I... Order, order in the court. <coughs> Proceed, Mr. O'Day. Why, I never knowed what it was until two months ago to have my fill of bananas and candy and ginger snaps and all such knickknacks as them. Order! Order! Also, all my life long, I've been wanting to go to a circus. Yeah, but never till three days ago. I didn't never get no chance to go to one. That gentleman yonder lawyer sublet there, he loud just now that I was leading a lot of little boys in this here town into bad habits. And he spoke of my having egged them on to steal watermelons from Mr. Bell's watermelon patch. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you the truth about them watermelons. They wasn't really stole at all. I seen Mr. Bell aforehand, and I arranged to pay him in full for whatever damage was done. You see, I knowed watermelons tasted sweeter to a boy if he thought he'd hooked them. <laughs> if I was wrong, I'm sorry for it. And as for the money I spent taking them kids to the circus, I didn't want no poor child in this town to grow up to be as old as I am without ever having been to at least one circus. And just one thing more. Mr. Sublette said a minute ago that I was in my second childhood. Meaning no offense, sir, but you was wrong there, too. A man can't have no second childhood without he's had his first childhood. I'm more than 70 years old now, but I'm trying to be a boy before it's too late. I reckon that's all, Judge. <clears throat> Mr. Sublet, Mr. O'Day, this court has, with the words just spoken by this man, been sufficiently advised as to the sanity of the man himself. Petition dismissed. Just one thing more. It is the private opinion of this court that not only is the late defendant sane, but that he is the sanest man in this entire jurisdiction. Court stands adjourned. Late that same afternoon, Judge Priest sat on the front porch of his old white house out on Clay Street, waiting to be summoned into supper. People Day opened the front gate and came up the gravel walk. The judge rose to meet his visit. Well, well. Come in, Peep. Come in. Sit down a spell and rest your face and hands. Well, I ain't got but a minute, Judge. I just come out to thank you and to make you a little kind of a present. Oh, 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 oh. no. No, no, sir, Peep. I, I couldn't accept any reward for rendering a decision in a accordance with the plain facts. Well, it ain't no gift of money, Judge. I just happened to run on to a new kind of knick-knack that's just about the best thing I ever tasted. Here they are, Judge, for you. There's three kinds there. There's lemon, strawberry, and vanilla. 
Well, <laughs> well, if it's just candy, I thank you, Pete. Yeah, well, these are new. <laughs> uh, what are they, Pete? Well, the fella that sold them to me called them uh, called them uh, all day suckers. <laughs> is Ruth Hussey again. Peeper Day told us that what he missed most was just being a boy, enjoying the happy things a normal boy does, the happiness that comes from having what he never had, a home. We can't afford to wait until our ship comes in to enjoy one of the choicest of God's gifts, happiness in the home. And what's the best way to ensure happiness in the home and to keep it once it's been gained? It's family prayer, the faithful practice of daily family prayer. Peep got an unexpected legacy from overseas, and it brought a touch of happiness to his life, a happiness he was generous in spreading. God's certain legacy comes to homes where there's daily family prayer, and it's rich beyond compare. It's peace and harmony, love and unity. And again, we remind you, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, your family theater has brought you Old Judge Priest, with George Murphy as narrator, Charlie Ruggles as Pete O'Day, and Parley Bear in the title role. Your hostess was Ruth Hussey. Others in our cast were Horace Murphy, Virginia Gregg, Victor Perrin, James Strigler, and Harold Dierenfort. This adaptation of Irvin S. Cobb's classic was written by Fred Howard, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. Our series of family theater broadcasts are made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them, and to you, our humble thanks. This is Gene Baker inviting you to join us next week at this time when your family theater will present Robert Ryan in Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities. Join us, won't you? through the facilities of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation and is broadcast to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. <laughs>